Well, welcome to Real Talk with Jordan Riley, where the real talk does not come from me. It comes directly from God's word. And before we get started today, please consider subscribing to our channel, giving this a thumbs up, and supporting what we do by going to realtalkwithjordan.com. On today's episode, we're going to talk about Stephen Furtick, and we're going to look at six things that he believes and teaches that should cause you to run in the opposite direction. And trust me, it's going to get a little scary. I am God Almighty! So are you ready? Let's go! Look at him and say, uh, this preacher only wears the suit at Lakewood, ever. Like, only for Pastor Joel. And they say, Bishop, Pastor Joel's not preaching. And the praise team is finished, and Marcus has dragged out the music as long as he can, and you've got to preach. What text do you preach? I think I know. But I want to see if I'm right. What text do you, you preach? You don't know. You don't know. You don't know. You get to hear Joyce Meyer preach the Bible. Are you kidding me? The greatest Bible teacher alive today came to Elevation Church. Now, you saw right there that he praises, affirms, associates with, and endorses other known false teachers. T.D. Jakes, Joel Osteen, Joyce Meyer. Those three people are prosperity pimps and Bible twisters. And God's word is so clear that we're to have nothing to do with them. Ephesians 5.11, we're to expose them. 2 John chapter 1, verses 9-11, through 11, we are to not even greet them or have them in our church or have them in our house. Not at all. We're to mark and avoid them according to Romans 16, verses 17 and 18. But no, Stephen Furtick, he celebrates them and praises them. Please understand that if I had any of those people on my show, I would lovingly rebuke them. I would share the gospel with them. I would call them to repent. And I would correct and expose their false teaching. But see, sad, the sad thing is, is that Stephen brings them right to you and says, hey, these are amazing people. We're so blessed to have these people in our church. No, they are wolves in sheep's clothing. So let's dive in and look at clear proof to why Stephen Furtick is a false teacher who needs to be marked and avoided. Number one, Stephen says that God broke the law for love. Oh, really? So what God did when he sent his son, and this is why we get excited in church, and this is why tears fill our eyes when we think about Jesus, and this is why the gospel is still good news in the world today, because God broke the law for love. I said to every sinner, God broke the law for love. So God is a sinner? <laughs> what? Said no verse ever. Psalm 18 verse 30 says that God is perfect in all his ways, not most of them or some of them. And James 2.10 is very clear that if you try to obey the law and you stumble at just one point, you are guilty of breaking the whole entire thing. So according to Stephen Furtick, God is just a big guilty sinner who's broken everything. He's not holy or righteous or perfect. Do you not see that Stephen is promoting and believing in a different and false God? Number two, he says that salvation is based on repeating a prayer. Blasphemy! Now you need to see this. One time I even had a campus pastor who was giving an invitation, like we will give in a moment for people who want to place their faith in Christ. And when we do it at our church, we have people repeat a prayer. It's just a means of allowing them to express their heart to God so that they can have a moment that they look back on and say, I placed my trust in Christ. And I'm not a mean guy, and I make mistakes up here too. But to me, he made a really big mistake when he was praying the prayer because he was inviting the people to pray, and he said, if you want to give your heart to Christ today and know for sure that you have a relationship with him, pray this. You know, Lord Jesus, I believe that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, and I believe without a doubt. That's the part he should have left out. I believe without a doubt that Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Savior of the world, today I give you my life. All of it was good. 
all of it was appropriate, and there is no other way to be saved but to confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. But that one parenthetical insert, without a doubt, I told him never again when you stand in the pulpit at elevation do I want you to put people in a position where you're telling them to pray something that they can't honestly pray. No, Stephen. Salvation is not based on what we do. It's based on what Jesus did on the finished work of the cross. That's what our salvation is based on. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 says that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. John 3 verses 3 through 8, Jesus said we are born from above. It's a gracious gift of Him that we are saved. It's by His choosing. Ephesians 1 verse 4. It's all God. It's Ezekiel 36, 25, and 26. Titus 3, verses 3 through 5. It is not based on our efforts. It's based on God's grace and mercy. Also, he says that you, know, you can't know that you're saved, and you can't have assurance of your salvation and your faith. That is a lie. I'm sorry. Now, why would he say this? It's because his church, his church, Elevation Church, you know, they say that your salvation is based on you. Well, yeah, if my salvation was based on me, I'd be scared too. I'd have doubts and fear and hesitations. And I'd be wondering. But the Bible is very clear. John chapter 20, verse 31, and 1 John 5, verse 13 is crystal clear. It says, these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. Did you see the confidence there? And please understand, once Jesus has saved you, you are saved forever. You cannot lose it. And a side note, this whole sinner's prayer that he was kind of talking about and referring to, the whole repeating a prayer thing, that is unbiblical. It's nowhere found in scripture. And I hope you will. none of you guys out there that are watching me will be in a church that ever promotes this garbage because it leads to many, many false conversions. Number three, Stephen, his preaching is extremely man-centered, and no, I'm not kidding. So I want to preach for a moment, and God told me to tell you this. No, he didn't. It's always been in you. Let's clap for Jacob, that after all he went through, he finally made it to Canaan. He made it all the way to Canaan, which is really remarkable because of the fact that along the way to Canaan, where God was bringing him back to, he had to deal with so many. I mean, Jacob, talk about pressure. Jacob is the grandson of Abraham. So you see right there, he doesn't teach scripture, he tickles ears. Stephen is a motivational speaker at best. Did you also see how he said, Well, God told me to tell you this? And that's wrong. That is absolutely false. That's called extra biblical revelation. And no, God is not telling Stephen what to say, just like he doesn't tell other people what to do and where to go and how to do it. God, everything God had to say is written in his word. It's Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. Also, he talks about the story of Jacob. We've got to celebrate Jacob and how he killed it. No, <laughs> not at all. The story of Jacob is about God and God's faithfulness so that God gets the glory, not Jacob. See, you understand that a pastor's job is not to pump you up. It's not to tell stories and entertain and tell jokes. No, it's to preach the word. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 is crystal clear. Number four, Stephen says that God's power is limited. Are you kidding me? The power of God was in Jesus, the healing power of God, the restoring power of God. The same power that made demons flee was in Nazareth, but Jesus could not release it because it was trapped in their unbelief. And there's one thing that even Jesus can't do, one thing that even the Son of God can't do. Even Jesus cannot override your unbelief. I see y'all looking at me like, is that true? Thought he could do anything. He said he could not. He wanted to, he was prepared to, he was able to, and he couldn't. The power of God was in Nazareth, but it was trapped 
in their perspective. Well, sadly, those, the God that Stephen talks about and supposedly serves is a wimpy, sissified God. I mean, I guess Jesus is only partially omnipotent. <laughs> no, not at all. Last time I checked, God can do whatever he wants. That's what makes him God. And no one can stop him at all. He is omnipotent. He is omnipresent and omniscient. This is the God we serve of the Bible. Also, he mangles and rips out of context Mark chapter 6, verse 5, saying that Jesus couldn't do any miracles because of their unbelief. What a wimpy Jesus. <laughs> no, not at all. If you study in context, Jesus did do some miracles, but he chose not to heal all of them. Now, why is that? If you study the context, it's because those people there were demanding miracles. They were demanding evidence and proof, okay? And so Jesus chose not to demonstrate his power, okay? It has zero to do, this whole verse in Mark, has zero to do with God's ability to do anything. It's about God's sovereign choice because God knows the heart of men. And again, I'm going to say this again, Stephen Furtick is preaching and teaching a false Jesus. Number five, Stephen denies the Trinity. This is sad. That God is not limited by physical dimensions. And I know you know that, but he never really leaves. Okay? However, he does change forms. And now Jesus is taken from their sight and hidden in a cloud, but he did not leave. He just changed forms. He did not disappear. He just was no longer visible. Instead, he was internal. So according to Stephen, Jesus changes forms? <laughs> what? Said no verse ever. I mean, what about the whole baptism? Jesus was baptized in Matthew 3. Did Jesus transform right there in the water into a dove and then kind of did a ventriloquist act and spoke for God from heaven? Not at all. God is one God, according to the Bible, in three persons. He is a triune God. That's why the, the concept of the Trinity is extremely biblical. You see it all through the pages of Scripture. And if you do not believe in the Trinity, you are not a Christian. You are not saved because you are believing in a false and different God. And that's another reason why Stephen Furtick is a false teacher. And last but not least, number six, Stephen Furtick teaches that we are little gods. You got to watch this. And God said, I am to Moses. You know, my name is I am. He was trying to get him to see you are as I am. That's what a mirror does. God says, I want to see myself in you. When God sees you, he sees himself. He sees his son. Christ is the image of the invisible God. And if he is in you, he is more than the world against you. So God is trying to get us to see that as he is, so are we. <laughs> what? Said no verse ever. But we've heard this before. We heard this also from Kenneth Copeland. When I read in the Bible where he says, I am, I just smile and say, yes, I am too. So no, Stephen, we are not little gods. Not at all. See, God is sinless. He's holy. He's perfect. He's all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present. He's the creator. He's the eternal judge. We are none of those. Not at all. See, this is pure motivational speaking. It's pure manipulation as well. This is not biblical in any way, shape, or form. But this shouldn't surprise you coming from a guy who says he's God Almighty. I am God Almighty! See, Stephen Furtick is not full of the Holy Spirit. He's not full of God's Word. He's full of himself. And he constantly violates and twists God's Word. And he makes God's Word about himself and about you. And that's a problem. And sadly, because of this, millions of people flock to him on a daily basis because they want to be entertained. They want to be pumped up. They want to feel good about themselves because they don't want to be fed the pure word of God. 